Have you ever noticed that um, when someone is gathering somewhere and, and you ask them how they're doing, you can almost predict that some people will start a litany of this is bad and that's going wrong and oh my and isn't it awful and misery loves company and often it just grows until we have a a group of people grumbling and complaining. Sometimes they're believers, people who know God and, and claim to love him. Well, we've been talking about crossing the Red Sea, that Israel was given a miracle of God and, and uh, Passover and, and the things that God did to convince Pharaoh to let the people go. Today we're going to talk about a time very shortly after that, after the crossing of the Red Sea, and you would think that a miracle like that would carry you for a bit and that you'd trust God for a bit, but really in um, Exodus 16, it says they set out from Elam and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin. And that's Sin with a capital S. It's the name of a place. It's not talking about the Sin, but Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, about six weeks later, um, this happens. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled grumbled. Some of the versions say murmured. That Moses. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron and um, the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And we know that's not true. (laughs) Moses had better things to do than take them all out to the wilderness to kill them. He was following God's plan, and they were exactly where God wanted them to be. They probably had just run through all the provisions that they brought with them from home and um, were feeling kind of pitiful and hungry. But do you think God, who had done all the things so far, didn't know exactly how much food they brought and that they would feel hungry? And I'd just like you to think for a minute, you're not in that situation, but you're in something right now. And as we look at this situation, knowing, because we have the Bible written down and we've heard this story before, but knowing that God already had a plan, wouldn't it have been great if they could have had a prayer meeting and said, God, we trust you. We know you have a plan, and maybe we did need to fast for a few hours or a day or something, but we know you have a plan. We know you didn't bring us out in the wilderness to kill us. Um, Just, you see our need. It's not a surprise to you that we've run through all the things we brought. And and we're just looking forward to see how you're going to feed us. Now, what if they had said that? (laughs) When the very same thing happened, the very same outcome, they'd have been able to praise God, you are the one we trust. But instead, they grumbled and whined and acted like Moses and Aaron were the problem. And they wished even that they would be back in Egypt. Now, remember what was happening in Egypt. They were killing all their boy babies. They were working as forced laborers. And apparently, they had plenty to eat, and that is good, but not enough to make life worth living. God was going to give them a great deliverance out of that as he had promised Abraham. And they were in it. They had seen miracles already. And really, it's really us two that do this. We have the promises of God. We say that we trust him, but often when we're heading into something really scary and bad and different, we're We're grumbling right along with them. Verse 4 says, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. (laughs) He was about to already. 
And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So God's plan had something to do with obedience, with trusting him, a lesson that he knew these people who had been slaves and hadn't really been able to worship God as they might have chosen to do, hadn't been able to mature in their faith, and hadn't learned about how important it is to know what God says and to obey it. Same thing for us today. If we don't know what God says, it's kind of hard for us to obey it. But when we do know what his word says and we choose to do otherwise, we need to learn the importance of obedience. And to God, it's really important. If you're a good parent, it's really important to you. That when you say, Johnny, don't go in the road out there. The cars come by really fast and they won't see you. We need Johnny to obey us, not to think, I'm going to see if my mom really knows a thing or two. And I'll stand out here a while and see if I get hit. We don't want children doing that. And God knows what's the most important, best thing for us and tells us that in his word. And and we need to obey it, just like what he's going to tell these folks they needed to do. It was about obedience. It was about knowing whether or not they'd pass the test, would they obey or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. And that principle will go into a greater amount on another day, but it's the idea of Sabbath. So there's seven days in a week, and God was saying, I'm going to send this bread. I'm going to rain bread from heaven. Of course, none of them had any idea what that is, but he says he was going to do it, and he's only going to do it six days a week, and they're just to gather enough what they need. They shouldn't try to save it in jars and pots and all over the place. Gather enough for that day, again, about trust. Trusting God would send it again the next day. And he says, on the sixth day, I'm going to put out, it's okay, they can gather twice as much as they do the other days, and, and it'll, it'll carry over. It won't go bad on the Sabbath, so they don't have to work on the Sabbath, so they can rest. Now, slaves generally work seven days a week. I imagine that was what Israel was used to. They don't really have the benefit of knowing what it's like to rest regularly. And often they get holidays off, but they'd been in Egypt a long time. And none of them, none of the people that were in the wilderness had ever had a day off every week, had no idea what that was. And so God knew, even though he wanted them to have rest, that he needed to enforce it. For us, mostly, if someone said day off every week, we'd say, good. You know, we'd be happy to have a day off, but they weren't even sure what that was. And God was going to enforce this as he taught it and give them some things to remember it by. Skipping down to verse 9, Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he's heard your grumbling. Now, God hears my grumbling and yours today, too. He hears it when we say things like, I don't know why God's not answering my prayer. I pray all the time and nothing seems to change. And he hears that. And just like he did not hold it against the Israelites, he knows who I am. He knows that I'm not mature enough so that sometimes I grumble. But does it make him pleased and happy? No. (laughs) So when we say, praise God, we love you, Jesus, we worship you, and then say, but, you know, I have this thing here over here that you're just not paying enough attention to. it's, It's not how we want to serve God. Verse 10 says, as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, They looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Now remember, they had a cloud by day, and when the cloud moved, they followed. They had a pillar of fire by night that was sort of like their all-night night light, you know, to remind them it's God who's leading us where we're going. It's God who protects us. God is with us always, and the cloud just kind of 
up in front of them really got their attention. And it reminded them that it was God who was there, who was protecting, who was providing, and who had heard them grumbling. And the Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight, you shall eat meat. Now, we already heard about bread, but it says at twilight, just as it's getting to be slightly dark, you shall eat meat. And in the morning, you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And we'll hear that sentence over and over and over with these miracles that God does for Israel. His purpose was that they would know that he was God. They would know his characteristics, that they could trust him, that he had their back, so to speak. He wanted them to succeed on this journey. And over and over, all the things that God teaches them, well, just to put it shortly, it should have taken them about 11 days to go from Egypt to the promised land. Anyone remember how long it took? 40 years. So they, they didn't learn their lessons very quickly, did they? He wanted them to know him by the time they got to the promised land. So that, again, starting right out, he wants them to realize each day as the bread appears, that night as the meat appears, that they can trust him, that he's God and that he heard. In the morning, quail came up and covered I'm sorry, in the evening, verse 13, quail came up and covered the camp, just sat everywhere, just didn't even try to run away. Anyone could pick up a quail and get it, you know, ready to eat. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. They had never seen it before. I don't even know that it snows or frosts in that area. I mean, the, the idea of frost being there in the desert, I don't know. But this stuff was something they'd never seen before. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? That actually is where we get the word manna for. What is it? Um, for they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer. And I say that's like a couple liters. That's quite a lot to eat. But anyway, it's what it says. According to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent, morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted and just, it just disappeared and was gone until the next morning. Now, I skipped that part, but actually, if they gathered too much, remember, they were just supposed to gather enough if they gathered too much, it got these icky worms in it and made an awful smell and reminded them, oh, yeah, I'm not supposed to save this up. I'm supposed to just get as much as I'm going to eat for the day. On the sixth day, though, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. It did not get worms in it, and it did not stink, and it didn't do that same thing that every other day of the week, if they tried to gather enough for two days, it would have been a mess, and they'd been reminded, nope, remember God said just enough for the day. And he specifically called out on the sixth day, gather enough for the seventh day, the Sabbath. Now, we say that we worship on the first day of the week to um, honor and remember and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And that's what the church has done for a very long time. I've even heard in my lifetime, people call Sunday the Sabbath. It's not. The Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. And as a nurse, most of my adult life, I had to work weekends. And so I couldn't always have Saturday or Sunday off. Sometimes I had to worship on a different day. Or if I was working day shift, I had to go to a Sunday night service or whatever. I had to figure that out. And on Saturday, you know, weekends included Saturday. But the idea of Sabbath is really what God was trying to teach Israel and 
It was always the seventh day for Israel. I don't want to have you think he let them do it on whatever day of the week they wanted. And we're not Israel. <laughs> we're the church. And we worship on the first day of the week, as I said. But the principle of Sabbath of resting is important. God created me, he created you, and he knows exactly what your body needs. And if we don't take a day of rest out of every seven days, we will get tired and burn out. <laughs> and it's almost like it's a, a promise of God that, you know, you can test it if you want, but we need a day off, not a day where we run around and shop and mow our grass and clean the house and make up a bunch of stuff and work so hard we think, I have to go back to work to rest. Not that. A day off where you literally rest, where you take time maybe and, and go out for a walk in the woods and think about God and creation and maybe you even sleep in if, if that's what your body feels like it needs. Or maybe you do something fun with your family, just just something to give you joy in life. And, and that Sabbath has not gone away, our need for a day out of every seven to rest. Most people today don't believe it's necessary, don't take a seventh day or any day off. But is it any wonder that we have such a, a massive number of people on medication for anxiety and depression? And we have people have to take a leave because they're exhausted. Life is exhausting because we're not really listening to God. We're not really recognizing the one who created me knows how much rest I need. And he says one day a week. So he was teaching that to Israel. On the seventh day, says verse 27 of chapter 16, some of the people went out together. <laughs> Even though they, they were told, they just, oh, really? He meant that. There really won't be any. So on the seventh day, some of the people still went out, found none. I don't know if they fasted or their neighbors gave them a little or what, but they really hadn't listened to God. They really hadn't believed that what he said was true. They, maybe they just forgot. They got in a habit already of going every day, and they forgot. Now, the house of Israel called uh, its name, the name of this bread from heaven, manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. It sounds like it was probably tasty. I know other places they say they could grind it almost like a grain and make it into bread. They could add it to things if they had fruit or other things that you didn't have to just eat the little bits of stuff, but you could, you know, kind of like some people eat breakfast cereal or something. It was ready to eat already, didn't have to be cooked. We see manna, and the reason it's important for you and I to know what is manna, how did that come about? It was God who provided it six days a week. Those are all principles that are so important for us to understand who God is. And really, manna was a prophetic for understanding before it ever came about of Jesus. He really says in the New Testament, when he talks to people about himself, he calls himself the bread from heaven. And he says, we, when we celebrate communion, he, he picks up the bread and he breaks it and he says, this bread is my body. He's trying to get them to get it. That to understand who Jesus is, you need to understand about bread. And bread is a basic kind of food that if people are starving and that's all they have, they can subsist on it for a bit. But Jesus is not a kind of bread that isn't going to cover it. If you're spiritually hungry, he's all you need. Just like this manna. It wasn't just like plain bread that I'd make out of flour and stuff. It was special food from God for these folks to sustain their physical bodies just like Jesus is what we need when we're starving spiritually. We don't really have a connection with God. We're feeling just, ugh, 
Why is everything going wrong? Why don't I understand this? Jesus is the answer. And that's why he says, I am the bread from heaven. It's actually spoken very well in John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now the Jewish people had gotten to the point, they revered Moses. They understood that because he prayed and was close to God and when he asked for something, God did it. God brought water from a rock. He did amazing things for them. They sort of forgot that Moses was not God. Moses was just a man very close to God, willing to do what God said, willing to be their leader. And Jesus was reminding them that Moses does not equal God, that it was actually God who sent that manna and God who had sent Jesus just as important to those folks when Jesus came into all of us for eternity, just as important as manna was then. He said that in John right after that miracle where, remember the little boy who had the lunch and he had little loaves and fishes mom had packed for him that day knowing he was going to try to go out and find and listen to Jesus and And he said that to them right after they were explosively happy about him taking that lunch and feeding everyone and having 12 basketfuls of fish and bread left over. They were thinking, this is the answer to world hunger. (laughs) We will never be hungry again if this guy is around. They were happy about that. And Jesus was trying to help them see it's not about that, that he himself was actually what they were hungry for. So they said, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he does. He brings us eternal life. He is the one that when we take him into us, we live. We live with life that is everlasting, that is good as God created us to live. And and, and it's a change. It's something that you don't, um, it, it changes everything from there on in someone's life. It's why we help children know who Jesus is. If they have an encounter with Jesus that that is real and they can connect and know who he is, it changes them forever. I was just six years old when I gave my heart to Jesus and I never, ever, ever went back. I know that's not what happens to everyone, but there's a possibility of that. If people are praying for that child and nurturing the child and teaching the child about Jesus, so that they mature in their faith. There's no reason for people to backslide. So it's important. Jesus knew it was important. And just as important as him getting their attention with feeding those 5,000 people so they would hear what he had to say, that really, you think this is great? Knowing me, Jesus, is, is far, far, far better And it continues, the idea of manna, for us to understand things in the New Testament, who Jesus was, what he is saying is going to happen yet in the future, we have to understand the Old Testament because God's plan never changed. He knew from the beginning that this was going to happen, and he planned already at the time Israel was in the wilderness. Did they have a chance that they could have gotten there in 11 days? Theoretically, yes. Did God know that they were going to grumble and turn back and not trust him and it was really going to take 40 years? Yes. So just like he knows that about you and about me and he knows how hard things are in our lives, but that doesn't mean that he says it's impossible. He says, Jesus said, with me, all things are possible. And this manna comes up one more really important time in the New Testament. The very last book in our Bibles written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit with Jesus speaking directly to the Apostle John, who was an old guy by now. 
Um, there are some words that are sometimes hard to understand, but when we take them in the context of understanding what does God's word say other times about manna, we see Revelation 2.17 in a very meaningful way. That first says, and it's talking to the church in Pergamum, and he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the, the message to each of these seven churches um, starts out that same way. It's saying, if you have ears, this is worth listening to. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. It's a secret between you and God. He has a name for you. And the name represents his, his knowing of your potential, of who you will be one day, of what you will lead one day, of the amazing things that you're going to do one day in his kingdom. It's, it's not just a name, it's a title. It's a who you are in God. And you already have that name. He already knows it. Remember, he knows the beginning to the end. In his mind, and his understanding, you are already that. <laughs> and the stuff, just like Israel went through the wilderness all that time, with him trying to teach them, it's really important that you obey me when I tell you something. <laughs> That's still important for us when we don't. When he says, pray, when he says, read my word, when he says, trust me, and we say, eh, I don't know, I just can't do that. We've got to keep learning the lesson over and over. And some of us, it takes a very long time. That's okay. God loves you. He has patience. But that hidden manna, and you have to think of the wonderfulness of what was manna. I mean, we know Jesus was wonderful. We know about his miracles. We know about his love. We know about his understanding. We know about all that he did. But that first manna in the wilderness, people didn't recognize what it was. They said, what is it? Some people today say that about this hidden manna. The hidden manna is knowing God. It's knowing him in a way that is, is beyond understanding if you haven't got that experience. It's knowing God in a way that his thoughts, his ways, his knowing what's best becomes what you do because you say, I want to do it your way, God. And that's, it's talking about that. That's a, a secret that people don't know. They often think about, well, yeah, I know you Christians, you, you pray and you say you're going to do what God says, and then you can spend the rest of your life trying to follow the rules and feeling guilty when you mess up. That's not it at all. Knowing Jesus is that secret, hidden manna. It's hidden from everyone who doesn't know him. And we are kind of like the... the, the, the something like, like an appetizer. When you go to a restaurant and they're always trying to sell you these expensive appetizers, you think, I can hardly afford to buy your meal, much less your appetizers. But we're there as a foretaste, as a beginning of people understanding when God is God for people, that's what happens. Your life, that's what happens. And when people see that and think, huh, this is delicious. This is wonderful. I, I want to be like that. I want to be able to trust God and pray for other people. I want to be confident and have peace and joy no matter how bumpy life gets. When people catch that and say, well, I don't understand it, but you're different than those other Christians in my stereotypical, I don't want to be anything like them idea. Maybe you, I do say, I'll listen to what you have to say. Now, what is it about you that's different? That's what our job is. Our job is not to be grumpy. You need to repent. 
You need to follow the rules. Your clothing is a mess. Your life is a mess. I don't like all those things you're doing. That's not our job. Our job is to be the appetizer, <laughs> to say, wow, look at that. Look what God has done in her life. Look what God did for him. Is that God? That's your job. And when we try to make it into a bunch of stuff that maybe we don't even understand how to do or want to do, trying to work our way into God's good graces, we mess it up terribly. We offend people. We give them the wrong impression of who God is. God's the one who gave manna to everyone, the grumblers, the ones who didn't remember they weren't supposed to get up and gather it on the seventh day, every single one, even people who just ran into Israel and thought, I'm going to hang out with these people. They seem to be doing pretty good. And they had camp followers like that. Those people got manna. Everyone got manna, plenty. All they had to do is don't save it up. Take just what you need for the day. And that's like grace. God's grace, it's open to everybody. It's open to everyone, whether they understand the rules or not. It's open to everyone. And they need to experience it first by seeing you or somebody who's kind of making it look like fun. Some Christians are saying, oh dear, another day, another dollar. My, I heard, I'm just, oh, I can't hardly drag through this day. Who wants to be like that? Who wants that? No one. God promises that if we will trust him, he'll give us the joy of the Lord. He'll give us peace that be, is, goes beyond understanding. And if we're living beneath that, and we say, well, I don't have it. We need to say, God, you promised that. I need that joy. I need peace in my life. Show me how I can be yours. Show me how I can make you Lord of my life. I need that secret manna. I need that understanding that I trust you. No matter what, if things go bad, I know that to be absent from my body here in this world is to be present with you. That's good, Paul says. He says, I don't even know which I'd rather have. I really want to be with the Lord, but I still want to teach all you guys. And he has a good attitude about it. I'm here for as long as God keeps me here. I'm not going to go and plan and carry on and make a lot of big, trying to make everything perfect and protect myself. I'm just throwing myself at life and saying, God, whatever you want, that's what I want. And I trust you. When I go, I'll be with you. That's the promise to you if you're a believer. So that name on the white stone designates the bearer of the stone. You know, they used to do all kinds of things in Greece, like with white stones and black stones, and you reached in, black stone, oh, bad for you. They understood the metaphor here more than we do. But the name on the white stone is the name that God has already called you his. He designates the bearer of that stone as a forgiven servant of the Most High God. He says, you are victorious. You are a conqueror already. And in Christ, that's who you are. That's who we all are. We should be the most upbeat people anyone could ever meet. <laughs> and if we're not, the Holy Spirit is just sitting there waiting for us to get this and say, here's my heart. God, I'm not getting this. Maybe somebody told me it was a different way. Maybe I learned it was about following the rules, and it's hard for me to get around that. I was taught that. I was taught, even though I'd given my heart to Jesus, I was taught, now, we had a list. It was unbelievable. In high school, I couldn't go to movies. I couldn't go to dances. I couldn't bowl. I couldn't... Um, I mean, I can't I, not drink or smoke or overeat or undereat or, or wear skirts that were too short or too long. I had to do it all right. Or I was afraid Jesus was coming back at any moment. And if I'm sitting in a movie theater, I'll be left behind. That's not true. That's not true. If you have Jesus in your heart, you will not be left behind. <laughs> you have already had all the sin that you might ever come up with a way to commit, it's already forgiven. 
Do we need to repent and say, sorry, yes, but it's already done. Jesus took care of that on the cross. It is done. It is finished, he said. That means everybody's totally saved that will accept Jesus into their heart and make him Lord of their life. So we might be living, you and I might be living beneath what God's promises have for us. And we might be listening to the wrong voice who says things that aren't in God's word. But what I read to you today is in God's word. It's a promise to you. It's a promise to anyone who will say, confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord. I believe that he's risen from the dead. I'm sorry for my sins. I want you as my savior. Anyone who will do that has that promise. And because of that, because Jesus lives, because he says that, because he is who he says he is, and he does do what he says he will do, and he keeps his promises, we don't have anything to worry about. Worry is something that's brought into us by the world around us, by little spirit beings that work for the devil who are just out there to be kill your joy. Don't let anyone kill your joy. The Holy Spirit promises you the joy of the Lord. It's awesome. It is wonderful. It is beyond anything that this world has to offer. So as we close today, be reminded who it is you serve. Be reminded what it is he says about you. And if you haven't ever really done it before, give him your whole heart. Say, I never really did it like that before, God. I think that will label you a fanatic or something like that. But that's okay. God doesn't use those icky labels. But give it all and trust God to help you to follow through. Don't say, well, I don't know. I, don't, I just don't think I could really do it. I don't want to promise God anything I can't do. It's the Holy Spirit's job to help you get through that and to keep going on and on and on with Jesus. Our job is to give up our will and say all for Jesus. Here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart. Here's my heart.